Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. So um, this video is about Sir Oswald Mosley in Ireland, and it's been requested by one of my many faithful viewers. Uh, well, Sir Oswald Mosley, I'm not going to go over his whole life, but he's born in 1896. He came from an upper-class family in the West Midlands of England. Um, he attended Winchester College, which is one of the most illustrious schools in the United Kingdom, and then Sandhurst, which is the Royal Military Academy, to train as an army officer. And it was there when the First World War broke out. He quickly had his course cut short, commissioned straight away, um, and he went to France to fight. Later, he joined the Royal Flying Corps. Remember that the Royal Flying Corps was part of the army. The Royal Air Force was only created as separate to the army on April Fool's Day, 1918. Um, so uh, whatever else you may say about him, and most people abominate Mosley, but uh, he was certainly physically gallant. He was unafraid of death, as he proved many times. He seemed a bit deranged to me, like, like a, had a screw loose or something. So I wonder, did he get a knock on the head in the First World War, just somehow traumatised, something like that? Because a lot of people suffered so badly in the First World War from their wounds. They were, they were mentally not quite all there for the rest of their lives. And he lived on until 1981. Anyway, he was elected to Parliament for Harrow, this area of London, in December 1918, just after the First World War ended. And he was the baby of the House, as in the youngest member of Parliament. So it seemed like he had a glittering young uh, career ahead of him. He's said to represent the hard-faced young men of 1918. Um, and so he said, although he was stood as a conservative, he considered himself primarily there to represent the war generation. People like himself who'd just risen to manhood as the war was breaking out. Um, so he's deeply concerned about veterans' affairs. Um, now, in uh, January 1919, Doyle Aaron met in Dublin. Doyle Aaron meaning like Irish Parliament. So these people had actually been elected to Westminster, the Parliament of the whole of the United Kingdom, Remembering at that time, the United Kingdom comprised the whole of Ireland as well as Great Britain. So a political party, Sinn Féin, had come to the fore not long before, meaning ourselves alone in the Irish language. And they proposed to use the UK's election. They would stand for all these Irish constituencies. And if they were elected, they would meet in Dublin and say that they're the Irish Parliament, a completely separate Irish Parliament. They would proclaim the Republic again, which had been proclaimed on Easter Monday, 1916. And um, if you're voting for them, they would say that's a vote for the Republic. We're separating from the United Kingdom. So that was that. So they did that on the 21st of January, 1919. Remember, as the First World War ended, there was a spirit of nationalism in the air. Countries had been militarised. They'd been used to the sight and the use of arms. Tens of millions of men had been mobilised in armies. It was uh, the first total war. And uh, nationalism was in ferment. The longer established nations like the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, their, their self-assurance had taken a knock, even the victorious countries, and they really had had a surfeit of nationalism. The smaller nations, which were so units within, within larger polities, like Ireland or Poland and so on, were coming to the fore. Several new countries have been created in Eastern Europe, or in some cases recreated, like Poland, created for the very first time, like Czechoslovakia. President Woodrow Wilson was in the White House, before the war had ended, he had promulgated his 14 points, one of which was national self-determination, not accepted by any other government, including his own, but that was if a group of people wish to separate from a larger political unit, then that must be permitted. As in, if the people in Ireland, for example, if most of us want to leave the United Kingdom and set up Ireland as a completely separate country, then we must be allowed to do so. Um, uh, however, Wilson considered Ireland to be an internal British matter, and he refused to get involved there. Anyway, so Sinn Féin had its armed face, the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, and they quickly started attacking the police, the Royal Irish Constabulary in Ireland. Better not give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of that uh, conflict. But anyway, many police officers were killed. The um, Irish police were almost exclusively Irish. Might sound silly to say that, but there are a few English pitmen and so on in it. But uh, some people were being killed, invalided out. Some people were reaching retirement age. Others resigned because they didn't want to get shot by the IRA or indeed some of them were semi-sympathetic to the IRA's cause. Um, so they were not being replaced. Very few recruits were coming forward. Therefore, the government decided they would get in more people to join from Great Britain. So the Royal Irish Constabulary uh, Special Reserve was set up. They're soon pejoratively known as the Black and Tans. 
And in certain counties of Ireland, ordinary policing broke down. The police were no longer searching for lost children or trying to catch pickpockets. Their main role was to fight the IRA, who were killing police officers wherever they could, or indeed anyone they suspected of being pro-union. Um, so the RIC went over there fighting the um, IRA, who obviously didn't wear uniforms. They were hiding out as much as they could. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an asymmetric conflict. The British Army was in Ireland involved in it as well. And um, in these uh, irregular conflicts, it usually lowers standards of chivalry, and that was that. And when the RIC caught an IRA suspect, they wanted to make him talk, and they did not treat him nicely. And that was kind of par for the course for any serious crime, even say burglary in Ireland or Great Britain anyway. Um, but that was that. So do you know someone's in IRA or not? And you can't tell if someone's an enemy, if he's in the IRA, until it's too late, until his gun's out and he's already shooting. And that kind of thing. So the RIC were understandably very trigger happy. And they were irate when their colleagues were killed. Sometimes they say, well, we're going to burn down the house of a known IRA man. Well, tell his family, you've got an hour to get out with your valuables, then we're going to burn it down, which they did. And so stories went around about this. Uh, collective punishment, sometimes there'll be an ambush. And the RIC were said, well, the people around here must have known about it and they didn't tip us off. Well, it'd be more than your life's worth to tip the people off because if you did tip off the Crown Forces, of the IRA, were laying in wait in an ambuscade, then the IRA would come and kill you, as they sometimes did. Um, so you people there, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, so uh, the RIC sometimes burnt down people's houses on slender evidence of the being IRA supporters. Obviously, they found a wanted man or arms hidden there. They say this arms cage proves it's not really a house, it's an enemy base. We're going to burn it down. Um, so that was that, although the RIC say they almost never killed civilians. Then um, some ex-soldiers uh, in the British Army, Irishmen, went to see uh, Mosley in the House of Commons and told him about this, people he really trusted, and he was horrified. He felt that the RIC was running amok, was out of control, so he made speeches denouncing their behaviour. Uh, and pretty soon he said, well, we should let um, most of Ireland at least leave the United Kingdom, and that's that. And he left the Conservative Party. So Tom Barry, in his book, Guerrilla Days in Ireland, um, he mentions, says that if a few British Conservatives spoke up for us. So presumably that's an allusion to uh, Oswald Mosley. Later, Mosley joined the, the Labour Party. Uh, he was a cabinet minister there. He had all sorts of radical ideas how to reduce unemployment. Remember this time of the slump, unemployment was stubbornly high. The UK was still suffering the after effects of the First World War. Massive debt. It was very difficult to, to pay that off. And huge other commitments paying pensions for war widows, for orphans, for ex-soldiers, so many disabled men, and the economy was sluggish. Markets have been lost in the United States during the First World War and never regained. And in many European countries, mainland European countries, the situation is even worse, like France and Germany. So that was that, and some people were losing faith in democracy, saying, well, look at communism in the Soviet Union, that's the way to go, it's run for the working class, benefiting of the common man. Obviously, that's nonsense. But anyway, some people thought that was a better way to achieve the common wheel. Look at Mussolini in Italy with his fascism. Totalitarianism is the way forward. The government must seize control of everything. We mustn't have the free media because it slows down the government. The government must be able to take drastic action and decisively tackle our problems. So Mosley was one of those very attracted to this. And there were a number of fascist groups around at the time, British fascisti. And the word fascist didn't acquire this opprobrious ring to it until the late 1930s. It was regarded as a reasonable political position possibly compatible with mainstream conservatism. Won't go too much into Mussolini, who'd once been a socialist, and then it's said to be sort of more or less a hired thug for uh, uh, Italian conservatives. They thought it was a bit of a job, but still useful. The other one brutal enough to keep the Reds in their place. So um, Mosley, he set up his new party briefly, and he had some Labour MPs in it for a while, including Nye Bevan, who was later a uh, luminary of the Labour Party one of the most adored heroes of Labour, but he pretty soon split with Mosley. And eventually, uh, Mosley set up his party, the British Union of Fascists, the BUF, or later on, it's the British Union of Fascists and National Socialists, going around wearing black shirts, calling themselves black shirts sometimes, giving the straight arm salute, going to Rome, openly expressing their adulation for Mussolini and things like that. So Mosley, um, one senator who joined his party was William Joyce, William Joyce was born in New York to an Irish family. Very unusually for the time, they returned to Ireland when Joyce was a toddler. He grew up in Galway, Ireland. Now, I think one of his parents was a Catholic, the other was a Protestant. I think he was brought up in the Church of Ireland, I'm not quite sure. But he lived in Galway, which despite being an overwhelmingly Catholic town, had elected a Unionist MP till not long before the First World War. 
Um, and when the um, conflict erupted in 1919, he took the side of the RIC. He was, he was too young to fight, but he organised a group of uh, children of RIC officers to try and do what they could for the cause. And then he was tipped off that his life was in danger. He was on an IRA death list. So he'd fled Ireland, he'd gone to Great Britain, he joined the British Army under age. After a few months, his age had been discovered, he'd been booted out because he was 15. But that was that. So that was William Joyce, and he um, later joined, as I say, the um, British Union of Fascists. He briefly had been a Conservative, and he carried a huge scar, a gash from his mouth, right up to about here. Um, who, who is supposedly fighting some communist that he got that. He was stewarding a, a Conservative political rally in Lambeth, London, in about 19... 22 and that happened. So these were fractious times and there was a lot of political violence. And, and he said this was the Lambeth honour, he caught it, you know, because he'd been poignarded by a communist. There is a less glorious version of his self-serving tale. Actually, it's an Irish woman who did that to him. She may have known he'd been back in the RIC, I'm not sure. But he obviously didn't want that story to come out. He wanted it to seem like he um, had committed some act of heroism. Um, so Mosley had embraced the Irish nationalist cause, indeed the Irish Republican cause to an extent. I think he didn't really want the Southern Ireland to leave the British Empire, indeed it didn't. It was a dominion, the Irish Free State, until 1949. Read about it, the restless dominion, constantly moving towards being a republic. And on Easter Monday, 1949, the republic was declared, uh, and that applied to the 26 counties. Obviously, Irish nationalists wanted the whole of Ireland to be part of it. And the Irish Constitution of 1937 said that the national territory can, can, consists of the entirety of Ireland, as in including those six counties which make up Northern Ireland. So uh, what else about um, uh, Mosley? Um, uh, yeah, the Republic idea he didn't, did not really like. Um, and Lord Haw Haw, he'd obviously wanted the south of Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom. But late that he said, all right, let this Treaty of 1921 stand. We should accept that the major portion of Ireland... Uh, lies outside the United Kingdom and tried to uh, establish cordial relations between um, uh, the Irish Free State, as it then was, and uh, and the United Kingdom. So in the lead up to the uh, Second World War, Mosley was all for neutrality, saying, um, Poland, what on earth has that got to do with us? I've never been to Poland, I'm not likely to ever go. It doesn't make a blind bit of difference to me which flag flies over to Poland. What a huge mistake it was to fight for Belgium. It's not our problem, okay? Neutrality, mind Britain's business. Who the heck would die for Beck? Colonel Joseph Beck being the Polish foreign minister and so on. And he was obviously regularly in touch with his ideological soulmates in Berlin. So his peace movement was quite popular. Remember 1938, the Munich Agreement, when Neville Chamberlain um, decided the United Kingdom would not go to war. Chamberlain was enormously popular. It's very fashionable to overlook that now that he was acting according to public opinion. Um, but uh, Mosley did not manage to avert a war. Now, look at the south of Ireland. Now, we didn't call ourselves the Irish Free State by that stage. Our Constitution 1937 said we're ERA, or in the Irish language, Ireland, even though we're only 26 counties. Okay, it's the majority of Ireland by, by, by area. About 80% of Ireland's landmass was part of ERA. And the Taoiseach, that's the Prime Minister, was Eamon de Valera, this New York-born half-Spaniard. Anyway, but de Valera said, let's remain neutral, and again, that was very popular indeed because nobody was going to get killed. And there could be no firmer proof that we were not um, part of the United Kingdom, that we stayed neutral. Remember, by this stage, the Dominions were internally self-governing and could pursue their own foreign policy. Canada, Australia, South Africa, and so on. They all chose to declare war. They could have chosen to stay at peace. And uh, Dublin said, we, the Irish, were staying out of it. And that was that. So Mosley approved of that policy. Um, and of course, there's at least a minority of people in, in, in Great Britain who felt the same. There was a thing called mass observation, which is a government project to try and um, take the temperature of public opinion. And there were, there were no opinion polls at the time. So um, almost nobody had television at this time. And there were newsreels in the cinema. When you went to the cinema, you say for up to three hours, watch a news item for about half an hour, watch a film for two or three hours. Anyway, the news item was updated once a week. You can see British Parthay news and movie tone news and so on, these newsreels. And it would show images of George VI, who was the king at the time, and then sometimes show his elder brother, Edward VIII. But Edward VIII, of course, was known as the Duke of Windsor because Edward VIII had abdicated in 1936 after only 11 months on the throne. And Edward VIII was um, suspected of Nazi sympathies and was known to want to keep the United Kingdom neutral. 
And um, uh, the anecdotal evidence is when the Duke of Windsor appeared on the screen, there was far louder and lustier cheering and applause for him. And uh, mass observation took this as, as um, an indication of public opinion that more people favoured him because to them he represented peace. Now, I know a lot of uh, British people tell themselves this self-laudatory version of the war, and of course, some people are gallant, but um, uh, people did not like suffering, surprise, surprise. Um, and if there was a chance to, to be at peace, especially if the UK didn't have to give up much to be at peace, then yeah, a lot of people would have gone for it. Would you like to be bombed? Would you like the idea you're going to get killed? How do you feel about your family and friends getting killed? I'm not keen myself. So, um, of course, the Blitz lowered morale. I know people say, oh, it only makes them dig their heels in. And um, they're uh, all the more determined to win through in the end. Now, opinion tends to polarise. You can read Anthony Beaver's book about Berlin when this sort of thing was happening to them towards the end of the war. That all right, there are a few hardy souls who are determined to die in a ditch. And maybe there's some people who are in the middle. But a lot of people are callow. I'm one of them and are more likely to cave in. They don't like suffering. Surprise, surprise. That's called being human. Um, so um, Mosley had been an anti-war agitator, although he said that when the war broke out that people's duty was to fight. The decision had been made. They must fight the hardest they ca could. And um, his uh, two eldest sons were grown up by this time, old enough to fight. The two littler ones from his second wife, they were not. And uh, remember that his first wife, she was a quarter Jewish. But I'm not sure Mosley was actually aware of that at the time. And Mosley was, of course, a raving anti-Semite. So May 1940, um, the Labour government, well, sorry, the, the, the coalition government was formed, a national government, mostly conservative under um, uh, Sir Winston Churchill as prime minister. He brought in the Simonite liberals, this minor faction of the Liberal Party, and uh, then the, um, the Labour Party. So say the 20 cabinet positions, there'd be about 10 conservatives, about seven Labour people and three uh, liberals. And eventually, the leader of the opposition, the Labour Party, uh, Clement Attlee, he became Deputy Prime Minister. But as the price of Labour coming into coalition to share power with the Conservatives, they demanded that uh, um, uh, Churchill use um, Regulation 18B of the Defence of the Realm Act. This goes back to the First World War, DORA, Defence of the Realm Act, uh, whereby the government could intern people without trial. Say, um, because we're in this exigent situation, it's force majeure and habeas corpus has been suspended, you can no longer be guaranteed a right to, to uh, trial or not to be detained without trial. So you can simply be arrested on the signature of the Home Secretary. Mosley and some of his top uh, um, British unit of fascist tonchos were arrested and they were interned and he was held in, in Holloway prison. But he was treated with great comfort. He briefly had to share a cell with someone. As he wrote in his autobiography, he shared a cell with a black person and being a fascist, everyone thought it was hilarious that he must hate this, but he said, no, I'm not any black. I got along with this black gentleman very well. I'm not sure that's true. But later on, he and his wife were allowed to live in a cottage on the, the prison grounds, and his wife had just given birth a month before, and he thought it was particularly low and cruel for the government to arrest her, bearing in mind that she parturated not long before. And they were allowed to hire the other, other prisoners as servants, so they're treated with great consideration. By 1944, the immediate danger had passed that it was considered safe to release him. Right after the war, Mosley published a book entitled My Answer, saying, no, I still believe we're wrong to fight the war. You know, I was trying to save tens of millions of lives. If we hadn't fought, not so many people would have been killed. Maybe there would have been a war in Eastern Europe, but there wouldn't have been a war in Western Europe, certainly not involving the United Kingdom. And my only loyalty, well, is to the United Kingdom and to the British Empire more widely. If we can stay at peace, it's our moral duty to do so. We should beef up our armed forces, armed to the teeth, and stay out. Anybody will know that if they do attack us, they'll pay a very high price indeed. But we're not going to fight unless absolutely necessary. This was an avoidable war, and therefore it was our moral uh, imperative to avoid it. Uh, that was his view. Um, and I suppose most people in the south of Ireland would have taken the same view. There's some people who are genuinely pro-Nazi, partly out of anglophobia. Take Dan Breen, um, uh, a uh, well-known IRA gunman from the 1920s. And he took that view, and indeed he had a portrait of Adolf Hitler on his wall. And the IRA was in touch with the Third Reich, and they actively supported them. Um, was it a love match, or was it a marriage of convenience? I, th I think a bit of both. Depends who you're talking to. The IRA obviously attacked the United Kingdom during uh, the Second World War, but made very little headway. So that was that. So Mosley, he and his wife, they had their passports confiscated. They couldn't go abroad. 
So the late 1940s, they went to um, the Republic of Ireland um, because one doesn't need a passport to travel between the two. And they lived briefly in Fermoy County, Cork, then in Galway. Finally, they got their passports back and they emigrated to Paris. Not quite sure the French authorities let them in, but there we are. We founded this political, new political party, the Union Movement, in the late 40s. Remember, 1948, the SS Empire Windrush arrived. Several hundred black people arrived from the Caribbean at Tilbury Docks. And there was consternation in certain uh, quarters uh, and in some uh, newspapers. And Mosley thought this was monstrous. And so he began campaigning, saying, oh, we mustn't allow non-white people to settle in the United Kingdom, which was ludicrous and obviously grossly unjust. Remember, the British Empire still exists back then. Uh, many of these Caribbean countries were, they were the British colonies, and there was free movement within the British Empire. White Britons would never consider that they didn't have the right to live in a um, uh, country in the Antilles if it was part of the British Empire. But um, some of them were aghast at the very notion that a black person had the right to reside and work in the United Kingdom. So he went to London preaching his uh, racialist screeds. And of course, words lead to action. And so black people, they were often subjected to the most rebarbative verbal abuse, physically attacked and so on, facing discrimination. Remember, there's no law against racial discrimination in those days, as Leary Constantine discovered. This um, black Trinidadian cricketer, barrister, when a hotel refused him accommodation on the sole basis of the colour of his skin. Fortunately, things have changed since, uh, but there we are. So he wasn't terribly concerned with Ireland. I remember in the south of Ireland, we had mass unemployment. Our economy was considerably weaker than Great Britain. Despite having stayed out of the war, despite benefiting from the Marshall Plan after the war, Republic of Ireland, really, our economic economy is a basket case. We had some of the most, uh, some of the most tardy economic growth in Western Europe. So there was mass immigration out of the Republic of Ireland, often to the United Kingdom. And so lots of um, Southern Irish people working in, in London in particular, and uh, Mosley addressed them, and he was sympathetic to the Irish nationalist cause, which obviously went down well. It might seem to be rather contradictory to be a British patriot and say, but the UK should get rid of some of its territory. How about the Unionist majority in Northern Ireland who, who are British, consider themselves British, they're to be booted out after all they've done? It, it was staggering. Um, but it was one of the man's, manif man man's manifold contradictions. Um, that was that. He really got nowhere else in politics, and then wasn't terribly concerned with Ireland thereafter. Uh, living in Paris, a neighbour of, of the Duke of Windsor, with whom he was on good terms socially, um, and then an early advocate of European unity. Europe a nation is a phrase which peppers his imaginatively titled autobiography. Sorry, no, My Life, that's what it's called. Um, and then, obviously, the um, uh, Ulster conflict uh, erupted anew in 1969, but he didn't have very much to say. He was rather, at that stage, rather out of it, and only visited Great Britain from time to time. So that was Oswald Bosley. Um, his views on Ireland were, I suppose, um, highly eccentric.